On the morning of May 7, 1945, Germany surrendered, effectively ending World War II in Europe. During the war, Germany had developed many advanced technologies, including the V-1 flying bomb, the V-2 rocket, and the Messerschmitt 262 jet fighter. These advancements were kept highly secret, but now that Germany had fallen, they were up for grabs. Germany had already been split into three zones of post-war control during the Yalta Conference a couple months before the war ended. This meant that American, English, and Soviet intelligence teams were racing to retrieve as much precious equipment as they could before the division took place. Though America was trying to recover equipment and weapons, the most important of all were the Nazi scientists. The Joint Intelligence Objectives Agency, JIOA for short, was directly responsible for Operation Paperclip, a campaign to get these scientists away from the Soviets so they could work for us in the looming Cold War. However, in order to gain the upper hand, war criminals were never tried, but instead swiftly integrated into the newly formed military-industrial complex. And some of these scientists were even tried and found guilty, but were still brought to the U.S. By accepting these people into the country, the United States government willingly chose a policy of technology over justice. This raises an important question. Did the integration of Nazis into Cold War America cause an ideological contamination of government? In June of 1944, the Allied forces commenced an attack on German-occupied France. As American troops pushed back the German lines, small groups of intelligence officers, known as T-forces, followed. The T-forces' objective was to gather up German technology, research materials, and technicians, and bring them back for evaluation. It soon became apparent, however, that in order to completely understand this new technology, the brains that developed it would be needed as well. But the president, not wanting war criminals working in the U.S., flatly refused to sign any papers that would allow such operations. Fearing that without these scientists, the U.S. would be fatally crippled in the upcoming conflict with Russia, the Joint Chiefs of Staff overlooked FDR's refusal, and Operation Overcast was underway. This might have eventually become a problem had it not been for FDR's death on April 12, 1945. Truman was now in control of the White House, and, taken completely by surprise, and not having been briefed about the growing problems with Soviet Russia during his few weeks as vice president, was in no position to seize the reins of government. The Joint Chiefs of Staff decided to ask the newly appointed President Truman to expand Operation Overcast. He consented, and in August 1945, President Truman authorized Operation Paperclip. The Joint Intelligence Committee, which was the intelligence branch for the Joint Chiefs of Staff, set up its own subcommittee, the JIOA, created for the sole purpose of directing Operation Paperclip, with the exploitation branch under Army Intelligence of the War Department General Staff in charge of the physical execution of the project. Through this tangled web of sister agencies and subcommittees, the government was able to effectively hide, twist, and erase many parts of these Nazi scientists' pasts. So, though President Truman had expressed his concerns of having Nazis work in the U.S., much as President Roosevelt did, there was no way he would be able to verify anything these agencies did. The hunt for Nazi scientists now had official sanction. Werner von Braun was arguably the highest profile scientist to be brought from Germany under Operation Paperclip. During World War II, von Braun had worked for the German army developing the V-2 rocket, which the U.S. realized had great potential if coupled with their nearly perfected atom bomb. Though he was initially labeled as a security risk, the Office of the Military Government U.S., the body responsible for post-war occupation of Germany, found it hard to reach a conclusion about von Braun. The areas where he had worked were now under Soviet control, and the Americans could not find hard evidence one way or another though they did know that the Dora concentration camp was the sole source of labor for the V-2 factory Mittelwerk, there was no evidence directly linking him to it. Although not everyone accepted the government's spin on his past, Tom Lehrer and Mort Sal being two prominent such figures, von Braun's contributions are undeniable. He has since gone to start the space program in conjunction with NASA. He was the chief architect of the Saturn V launch vehicle, and his work on rockets led to the Space Shuttle and the International Space Station. Arthur Rudolf, on the other hand, is a different story. 
He was Mitlevac's production director from 1934 to 1945 and was in charge of the Prisoner Labor Supply Office. This meant that he was directly responsible for not only the number of workers in the factories, but also their conditions. He controlled the hours, the food and drink, and, though less directly, the treatment of the prisoners by his subordinates. At first this information was pushed aside, but eventually caught up with him when in 1984, already happily retired, he received a visit from the Office of Special Investigations. Over the past couple years, they had been gathering information about his war crimes after Elie Rosenbaum, a Harvard Law student, tipped them off. After admitting to the utilization of slave labor but not wanting to face trial, Arthur Rudolf renounced his U.S. citizenship and left the country for Germany. But America did not only bring engineers from Germany. Many doctors were brought to the U.S. as well. Hermann Becker Freising was a doctor who joined the Nazi party in 1933. He worked for the Luftwaffe on projects dedicated to helping pilots survive in cases of aircraft malfunction and open sea crashes. On May 19, 1944, Hermann Becker Freising attended a conference concerning the potability of seawater. In his closing statement at the conference, Becker Freising expressed his concerns that the experiments were not conducted at realistic enough conditions of sea distress and needed to be tested to a greater extent. Because such experiments would likely result in death, using volunteers was out of the question. Instead, Dachau concentration camp inmates were used. Becker Freising later assisted in carrying out the experiments. Because of this, he was sentenced to 20 years in prison for crimes against humanity, though he later appealed, and with a little help, had his sentence commuted to 10 years. After serving his time, Becca Freising was transported under Operation Paperclip to the U.S. and worked for the Army in Texas. In 1947, at the Nuremberg Doctors' Trial, Kurt Blume, the chief of research on bacteriological warfare in Germany during World War II, was accused of being responsible for experiments on involuntary human subjects and, quote, the murder and mistreatment of tens of thousands of Polish nationals. The human experiments with plague vaccines and various bacteria Bloma carried out at the Dachau concentration camp were well known of and documented, but under U.S. pressure Bloma was acquitted. Two months later, he was moved to the United States after the JAOA hid any records that mentioned the Nuremberg trial or his war crimes in order for him to safely enter the U.S. In all, 1,600 Nazi scientists were brought to the U.S. Each of the scientists had something to contribute to their respective fields. But how does one weigh the benefits? These people were once Nazis, which must somehow have carried over to their work later on in life. Some of them were even convicted war criminals. The U.S. government then employed them and simply hid their past from the public. The government certainly still has this power to manipulate history. In 1998, the Senate passed the Nazi War Crimes Disclosure Act. The act declared that war criminals should not be protected any longer by the government. However, most of the act is simply a list of possible reasons for exemption, and so many records remain undisclosed to the public. In the case of Operation Paperclip, key government agencies made decisions concerning the greater public good. They decided which war criminals were worth bringing into the country without any real checks on what they were doing. This moral hazard still exists now, and even to a greater extent, for we live in a time of secret prisons and the suspension of habeas corpus. But it is still a government for the people, by the people, and it shall not perish from this earth.
want to do now is I want to turn our attention to, to two things. Um, we've got 20 minutes, and I want to read from Nick's paper, because I think it's very important. And I want to put up an appropriate image, and I'm trying to think what image I should put up. I need to tell you a little bit about how this came about, all right? For several years now, I have known that there was something very, very strange in the background of JPL, all right? And that strangeness is an individual named Alistair Crowley. What is not generally known is that Alistair Crowley was very closely connected with the engineer and genius founder of what would eventually become known as the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. So let me read, and I have never read one of these things, a paper that Nick and I are going to put on the web in the next few days called JPL Parsons and the Crowley Connection. This subject is very, very esoteric. Not that the rest of the evening has been run of the mill. It deals with the history of our own government and some of the very institutions responsible for sending robots out now between the planets. Institutions rich in traditions and even outright symbolism. But of what nature? On what used to be a desolate spot in the Arroyo Seco, north of Pasadena, lies a 165-acre complex called JPL, or the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And give me a pause here, and in fact I can show you a picture. Jack Parsons, a brilliant young Caltech chemist and founder of JPL, forever changed the course of rocketry by adding with a brilliant flash of insight the chemical potassium perchlorate to the then standard black powder solid rocket ignition systems being employed at the time, in the mid-1930s. His long-range hope was similar to another rocket pioneer, Robert Goddard's, in the same period. He wished to develop a more powerful means of eventually exploring space beyond our planet. But official government funding of such impractical dreams in the 30s was essentially non-existent. With the advent of the Second World War, all that changed. Only the sudden infusion of dizzying new funding into this new science was not for scientific exploration. It was for rocketry's more obvious military applications. Through Jack Parsons, JPL thus developed an early institutional expertise in solid rocket propulsion and instrumentation. In parallel in this period to Robert Goddard's individual separate Roswell, New Mexico efforts at liquid fuel experimentation, also carried out in these mid-1930s to 1940s. But in 1957, after the shock of the first Soviet satellite named Sputnik, and a highly visible but explosive failure by a U.S. Navy response, JPL was ultimately chosen by the Army to attempt to salvage American national pride through the launch of a JPL artificial satellite. The successful orbiting of JPL's Explorer 1, whose primary discovery would be the existence of the so-called Van Allen radiation belts encircling the planet, marked the beginning of the American Space Age, January 31, 1958. It also marked the ascendancy of JPL as the nation's most visible premier space center. As stated, Originally under Army jurisdiction, President Eisenhower, concerned about JPL in the hands of the growing Cold War military-industrial complex, had JPL transferred to the civilian sector under a NASA Caltech contract in 1959, where it was given its eventual mandate, if not virtual monopoly, among NASA's many other centers, to explore deep space. JPL, again, just up the street led the U.S. unmanned missions to the moon with the Ranger and Surveyor projects in the 1960s, to Mercury, Venus, and Mars with Mariners 2 through 10, to Mars with Vikings 1 and 2, and to Jupiter and Saturn and beyond with the equally historic Voyagers. JPL also conducted tracking and communications through the DSM, the Deep Space Network, for Pioneers 10 and 11, 
and has recently carried out Galileo projects, which not only re-imaged and carried out experiments to study Jupiter's atmosphere, but have sent the spacecraft to re-image Europa, one of Jupiter's so-called Galilean moons, now known to have volcanic activity, oceans, and enough internal heat to have possibly spawned life forms that, if they exist, should have evolved and remained undisturbed for five billion years. And many of you know that I wrote about that about 20 years ago, which NASA is very conveniently forgetting. As also stated earlier, John Whitesides Parsons, chemist and rocket engineer extraordinaire, was the actual creator of the Caltech lab eventually called JPL, or, among insiders, Jack Parsons Lab. And while there is very little official biographical information to be found on him in the general liter literature, it is a curious fact that most of his papers and books are still classified by the Department of Defense. One thing that is known, at least within the planetary science community, is that Parsons has been officially immortalized by the International Astronomical Union by having a crater named for him on the moon. It is therefore extremely puzzling that the rest of Parsons' life, in comparison to far more obscure space scientists and engineers, is relatively unknown, even among avid JPL enthusiasts. Perhaps the reason for this paucity of information has something, perhaps a lot, to do with certain aspects of Parsons' private life that most at NASA and JPL, actually in the know, might rather be forgotten. Because one striking aspect of Parsons' private life that has been well documented outside of official governmental sources and publications is his curious association with an individual known as Alistair Crowley. Given Crowley's overwhelming and intensely controversial interests, the demonstrable importance of Crowley in Jack Parsons' private and professional life, stay tuned, and an inexplicable Crowleyan pattern that has recently emerged in all JPL missions, one feels compelled to ask at this late date, who was Alistair Crowley? And what was his heretofore unseen but apparently highly influential role? in the founding and evolution of this critical national space facility called JPL. Alistair Crowley was the premier self-styled Western magician of the 20th century, who some have called the most evil man in the world. Crowley simply termed himself the Great Beast, he wouldn't invite him to dinner, whose secret name in his order was Phoenix, for reasons that will later become apparent. Parsons became one of Crowley's greatest students and was said to have been his personally chosen successor. I mean, let me repeat that. We have documentation, no question, that Parsons was selected by Crowley to be his successor in these arcane magical rituals and ceremonies and practices. This is not something you're going to get from a NASA press release, all right? Parsons quickly moved up the ranks of Crowley's organization called the Order of the Eastern Temple and was eventually appointed head of the lodge in Pasadena by Crowley himself. Parsons swore an oath of allegiance to guide humanity into, quote, an age of communion with the gods. Is this, is this something you're going to read in NASA's official stuff? using his demonstrable vast talents of insight and science and, in his own words, magic. The objectives of those like Crowley who practice Western magic is ostensibly, quote, to advance humanity by contact with higher intelligence, that is, read with extraterrestrials. Gosh, is that what they're up to? either by calling them down or traveling to their planets, which if the objects on STS-48 and STS-80 are what they now appear to be, we almost certainly can. These are things you've seen on the UN briefing and you're going to see before Christmas on our analysis of the shuttle video that was 
downlinked live by NASA in December of last year. According to Crowley, one can contact these higher intelligences by becoming one with them, that is, by metamorphing into man-gods, or supermen. This was Crowley's primary goal, attainable in his beliefs to the ancient systems of the Hebrew and Greek Kabbalah and other forms of metaphysical, quote, science. All practitioners of magic, philosophically based occultists such as the Theosophists or Freemasons, have been consumed with interest of finding the origins of the human race. You just have to read what they write. It is claimed by the founders of many of these secret orders that they have received guidance from direct contact with those who call themselves the secret chiefs of the great white brotherhood. These masters, we are told, have literally dictated the laws and agendas of these mystery schools of ancient thought and wisdom. Now, Crowley, in the latter part of the last century, and the beginning of this, the 20th, claimed to have had many such indescribable contacts, but two were of the greatest importance in apparently redirecting his entire life, and thus changing the face of modern magic for all who followed. And as astonishing as it may seem, it may be that almost a century ago, Crowley was given a revelation about things that are coming to pass, even as we speak here tonight. The first contact that Crowley relates was in April of 1904 in Cairo. Cairo, by the way, is Seleucid Arabic for Mars. Crowley tells us that he encountered an entity who he considered to be his, quote, holy guardian angel. This identity entity identified himself as Iwas and proceeded to dictate to Crowley the so-called Book of the Law, or what would eventually become to some the canon of 20th century magical practice. In this book, Iwas decrees that, quote, do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. And then he goes on to say, and I am a god of war and vengeance. I want to get something up here. Okay. I am a god of war and vengeance. Choose ye an island and fortify it. Done it about with enginery of war. I will give you a war engine. And with it you shall smite the people and none shall stand before you. I am the warrior lord of the forties. Remember, this was channeled by Crowley in 1904. The last statement is astonishing and quite prophetic considering it was dictated 40 years before World War II and 93 years before the revelations you have seen this evening, 93 being the number of the book of the law. But more about that significance later. Iwas also gave Crowley a code, a cipher, which is being used by some UFOlogists in their continuing efforts to decode some UFO contact experiences. And I have no experience whatever with the use of that, so it's merely part of the record. Here's where things get very curious. Parsons' wife and magical partner, Marjorie Cameron, stated in 1953, in a book written by the successor to Crowley after Parsons kind of blew up, <laughs> as we will discuss in a moment, stated in 53 that she believed that the war engine referred to by Iwas was none other 
than the flying saucer. That it would one day bring her back home to Mars, which she believed was somehow her birthplace, thus escaping a future perilous event destined for Earth. This, of course, speaks to the Phoenix theme, so prevalent in Crowley and Lore. This perilous event, according to Crowley, was to usher in the secret eon, or secret ion, depending upon how you spell it, thought to be embedded in humanity, which could be prematurely, before the actual predicted date, made manifest for the initiated through ritual sex magic. Now, one of the curious things that David Oates, when we did the presentation up in Pasadena, withheld until I kind of forced him to put it on the table, was that a lot of the backwards reverse speeches of the NASA JPL Pathfinder team have to do with sex with the rocks. It's on the tapes. We are told that Tibet is where these masters of the Great White Brotherhood, also called the Himalayan Brotherhood, originate. In this mythology, the Aryan race itself is also believed to have come from the mountains of Tibet, lying at 33 degrees north latitude. Strange but true, Roswell, the UFO crash in 1947, Mount Palomar, the largest post-war observatory, Rancho Santa Fe, Heaven's Gate, White Sands, the first A-bomb test, Nagasaki, Japan, the second A-bomb dropped, and Baghdad, Iraq, highlight, of course, of the Gulf War, and Phoenix, Arizona, the Phoenix Lights moving across the city at 19.5 degrees, and Dallas, site of the Kennedy assassination, are all at 33 degrees. Incidentally, Santiago, Chile, which lies at 33 south, where the anomalous NASA UFOs on the SDS-80 video were initially filmed, uh, is also apparently an interesting part of this pattern, which we'll lay out in more detail when we produce the video. The word Aryan, incidentally, comes from the word Aries, which is the first sign of the Western astrological zodiac, ruled, of course, by Mars. There are many legends concerning Tibet that speak of a race of supermen inhabiting this region on Earth, a legend which many German intelligentsia and pre-World War II occult societies, like the Thule Society, which Hitler was a member of, adhered to. Unbeknownst to most of the world today, the founders of the Nazi party, starting with Hitler himself, were steeped in these occult traditions and were profoundly influenced by the teachings of the secret Thule society, whose demonstrably racist ideologies were a warped version of theosophy and ancient German mythology. By the time of Hitler's rise, most of pre-World War II European occult traditions were dominated by the magical system that Crowley painstakingly created. And Hitler himself was envious of Crowley's infamy as the most evil man in the world, as well as his magical prowess. Hitler said this in several volumes, including one called Hitler Speaks. Crowley claims that his second otherworldly encounter, which resulted in an even more profound influence on his work in magic, occurred at Montauk, Long Island in New York in 1918. This entity introduced himself as Lamb, which Crowley was quick to point out meant pathmaker, pathfinder, in the Tibetan language. It is from this word that Lamas of Tibet are so called. The Lamb was also the ancient symbol for Aries, Mars, as well as the resurrected God, Tammuz, Osiris, Christ, etc. Rising from the ashes, Crowley drew an effigy of Lamb, which eerily represents the popular modern image of an alien some half a century later.
Abraham was also the ancient symbol for Aries, Mars, as well as the resurrected God, Tammuz, Osiris, Christ, etc. smite the heaven with arrows, the Lord killed them, one man through the hand of his neighbor. In the third division of those who said, we will ascend to heaven and fight against him, the Lord scattered them throughout the earth. Those were the ones whose languages were confounded, I suppose. And those who were left amongst them, when they knew and understood the evil which was coming upon them, they forsook the building, and they also became scattered upon the face of the whole earth. And they ceased building the city and the tower. Therefore he called that place Babel, for there the Lord confounded the language of the whole earth. Behold, it was at the east of the land of Shinar. So uh, now you've got all these people, who's, what's left of them. I mean, a fair amount of them were killed off. Others were turned into <laughs> elephants and apes, I guess, or whatever. And everybody else, you know, their languages were scattered. I mean, there's a lot of chaos going there. So all these groups of people went 70 different directions, uh, you had 70 angels divided up into 70 different people groups, um, 70 different languages, go away talking about the same guy now in different languages. And that's how I believe Nimrod became known as the man of myth, particularly uh, in Assyria, Babylon, Egyptian, and Greek. And I credit these two guys right here, these two authors, Peter Goodgame in his online book, The Geese of Discovery, that you can read for free at redmoonrising.com. At least I think you still can. He used to have it up there. Uh, and Tom Horn's book, uh, Nephilim Stargates and Apollyon Rising, who he, he did an update of that book. It's now called Zenith 2016. But they, uh, they had a, a, a pretty profound impact on my thinking regarding Nimrod and how he became uh, what I refer to as the man of many names and some of the names that he, were, he became known by. A lot of different characters in different mythologies. Uh, why? Because they were all worshiping this guy at one time. They were all under his leadership. He was their god for all intents and purposes. And their plan was to basically get uh, Yahuwah out of heaven and set up their own gods and probably, presumably, set Nimrod up as king in heaven. Um, so God d divided the languages to go around talking about this guy. And all kinds of symbols become associated with him as well as names, such as the Ankh. Uh, which represents resurrection, incidentally. The all-seeing eye. Uh, this is a bust of Sargon, I believe one of the other characters he was known by. And um, he lost his left eye, Nimrod did, apparently, in the ancient records. And that motif shows up a lot uh, throughout the ancient myths of one of the father gods missing an eye. Incidentally, it's the same left eye that's on the back of your dollar bill. That's why I don't like carrying them anymore. I call them Nimrods. I don't like carrying them with me at all. Uh, cause, because I believe it is a talisman going right back to this false god. You know, we just look at different depictions of this guy. Like you have Gilgamesh here on the left, uh, and apparently he's a giant. If, if that's a full-size lion, he's a pretty big dude there. Uh, so you got a club and a lion. You have Orion, same motif, club and a lion. You've got Baal in the same pose here as Nimrod, you know, with a, the same exact pose. And you got the pictures of Ninurta there. Um, there's over and over and over again, we see depictions in, across different cultures regarding their gods, showing their god uh, with a club, a raised arm, and a lot of times with a lion. And of course, we know that Yeshua is referred to as the, what, lion of the tribe of Judah. So I believe that there's one who has always been at war with the lion. And I'm going to say that one was and is not, and yet will be, Nimrod. And when you start looking in the ancient record of the ancient gods and who he could have been known as in the different pantheons, I believe that he manifests himself in the Assyrian, Babylonian, Akkadian uh, religions as uh, Marduk, Ninurta, and Gilgamesh. Why three different names? Well, you're dealing with different groups and, and different uh, morphologies of their myths over time. Gilgamesh uh, was really just sort of a, uh, a fictional story, an allegory. Many believe uh, it was sort of like the blockbuster movie of the day. Um, so you have him there. And I believe he manifests in the Egyptian pantheon as Osiris. A lot of synchronicity uh, between iconography of Nimrod and Osiris. And in the Greek uh, pantheon, I believe he manifests as Apollo. I had a little bit of a hard time coming to this conclusion at first, but after I 
uh, tracked it through Dionysus uh, and saw similarities between Osiris and Dionysus um, and other people liking, likening them together, uh, I came to believe that uh, Dionysus and Apollo are sort of opposing personality types, or Apollo in, in the post-Hellenistic uh, uh, snow no secret especially. that NASA was founded by former Nazis. Uh, more than 1,600 Nazis escaped the judgment they deserved and found refuge in America. A group of 104 rock, German rocket scientists, including Werner von Braun, Ludwig Roth, and Arthur Rudolph, are pictured here at Fort Bliss, Texas in 1946. Many had worked to develop the V-2 rocket at Pienamunde, Germany, and came to the United States after World War II, subsequently working on various rockets, including the Explorer 1 space rocket and the Saturn V rocket at NASA. Now, all you have to do is go back and look at what was going on in World War II with the Nazis and their obsession with the Aryan nation, you know, creating an Aryan nation, the, bringing back the worship of the uh, Nordic gods. Um, they, they were all about the Nephilim. Well, so is NASA. I mean, look at, just look at what they named the programs for crying out loud, right? Starting with Mercury, messenger of the gods. You know, in, in Roman mythology, Mercury, or Her, uh, also known as um, Hermes to the Greeks, uh, was, of course, he's the messenger of the god, but he was the son of Maya. Now, who was Maya? Well, she was the daughter of the Titan Atlas and one of the seven sisters known as the Pleiades. And his father is Jupiter, or Zeus to the Greeks. As Hermes, he was the god of transitions and boundaries moving freely between worlds of the mortal and the divine. He uh, was also what's called the psychopomp conductor of souls to the underworld, uh, underworld where, of course, Osiris rules. Uh, Hermes, Mercury, was a, has a strong connection to Apollo in the sense that he had, uh, was a half-brother and also that he carried the caduceus, you know, the double serpent entwined staff we see, like the medical symbol, uh, which was given to him by Apollo. The caduceus is a recognized symbol of commerce and negotiation, two realms in which balanced exchange and reciprocity are equally recognized as ideals. So what exactly was going to be exchanged in space with the Mercury program? Well, on February 20th, 1962, the Atlas rocket carried John Glenn into orbit aboard the Friendship 7. This was the flight that ushered in the new era of space travel, Think of the symbolism being employed here, folks. Atlas, right, was the father of Mercury. Atlas, the Atlas rocket, which looks like a big giant penis, shot up into space with one passenger seed on board. Thus, John Glenn, one of the seven Mercury astronauts, was the ambassador of Earth, sent up in friendship with the number seven, which, of course, many would associate the number seven with the number of God. So was he to play the role of messenger of the gods? You know, bringing back something, sending up something, you know, envoy. And of course, John Glenn's a Freemason and was a member of the Demole, uh, Demole uh, International, the Masonic Youth Organization. So nothing would surprise me when it comes to any of that stuff. Okay, then we go on to the Gemini Project. The Gemini Program was the intermediate program, you know, between Mercury and the Apollo programs. In mythology... The Gemini were the twin brothers Castor and Pollux. Their mother was Leda, and once again, their father was, ding, 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 Zeus. In some accounts, however, Pollux was regarded as the son of Zeus, while Castor was the son of a mortal, Tyndareus. One mortal, the other immortal. Um, it, it was also a common belief that one would live among the gods while the other was among the dead. Again, we see this duality dealing with pagan deities in the other underworld. This is, of course, also reflected in the Masonic beliefs concerning Osiris in the underworld and his reincarnation as Horus in the upper world, or to put it in Nimrod terms, Nimrod and Tammuz. The uh, Dioscori, as they're sometimes called, were regarded as helpers of mankind and patrons of travelers. Sailors often invoked them to seek favorable winds. It seems therefore ra rather fitting that as NASA pushed forward with the goal of going to the moon, that they would need favorable winds from yet more children of Zeus, the god not only of the Greeks, but clearly of the United States of America as well. The Gemini astronauts flew into space atop the Titan II rocket. Here again, we see a direct tie to the first generation Nephilim, the Titans of mythology 
who were the product of the union of angels mating with humans. Perhaps it was a fitting name for the, this stage of the program as one of their primary mission objectives was to practice and perfect the docking, or let's say mating, mating process of the Gemini spaceship with the Agena target vehicle. So here we see the all too familiar symbolism of the phallus and the womb taking place. Then of course we come to the Apollo program. The Apollo astronauts travel atop the Saturn V rocket. Saturn, of course, known to the Greeks as Kronos, was the first Titan god of the Capitol, the original king of the gods during the golden age before his son Zeus overthrew him and took over. Zeus, as we know, was the father of Apollo, according to the Greek myths. Apollo 11 is probably the most famous of all the Apollo missions. It was the one that supposedly landed men on the moon for the first time. Now people will give me a hard time for that, but, you know, saying that. Um, I'm just going to say I, I remain open, but I am extremely skeptical of the official story. Um, I do believe we've been to the moon, but I do not believe we went there the way we were told and shown in 1969. Um, I, you know, I just have not seen enough evidence to convince me that, that what was shown on July, whatever, 20th, 1969 is legitimate. Um, so maybe I'm crazy. Maybe I got my tinfoil hat on, but, um, uh, whatever the case may be, even if it wasn't real or even if it was real, it was thoroughly Luciferian through and through. Okay. This is the most famous Apollo mission, Apollo 11. The men who flew that mission were Neil Armstrong commanding, Michael Collins as the command module pilot, and Edwin Buzz Aldrin as the lunar module pi pilot. Buzz Aldrin was a Scottish Rite Mason, and though hard to vet, some say that Armstrong was too. I've, I've seen conflicting stories on that. Now, many doubt this claim, but at the very least, there seems to be a strong consensus that he was a Mason. What intrigues me, intrigues me most about the Apollo 11 mission was, this was the one that accomplished, the, so supposedly accomplished the lofty goal of landing a man on the moon. And all of the symbolism in this particular uh, mission points right back to Nimrod stuff. Revelation 9-11, right? We see the name of the beast, Apollo, Apollyon. He's the Antichrist. Uh, now, there are some really interesting correlations between the numbers 9 and 11 scripture and this particular mission of Apollo. For instance, some have linked the nine, if you don't know what the nine is, do a Google on the nine, to the Aeneid of Egypt. The Aeneid were the nine great gods of the Atum, the, the Atum Shu, Tefnut, Gub, uh, Geb, Nut, Nephthys, who is the sister of Isis, Auser, another name for Osiris, Set, his brother, and Aset, a derivative name for Isis. The latter four, of course, as I mentioned before, is the acronym for NASA. If this link is indeed a solid one, <laughs> there are ancient legends that speak of the Zeptepi, the first time. And that was the age uh, that the Egyptians referred to as a time when the sky gods came down to earth, raising the land from the water. water. They came in flying boats and brought wisdom to mankind through the bloodlines of the pharaohs. Gods in flying boats? NASA, Apollo spaceship, eh, maybe it's all just a coincidence. Um, the eagle, the eagle, uh, Manly P. Hall says that when you see an eagle with a point on the back of its head, like on the back of your dollar bill and on the great seal, he said, nah, that's not, we, we put a fast one on you. That's a stylized, conventionalized phoenix. Well, the, the phoenix goes back to the Egyptian Banu. The Banu was the soul bird of Osiris. And so you've got this, This okay, let me kind of pull it all together. If Ishtar, Semiramis, Isis are one and the same, Columbia, and Osiris and Apollo and Nimrod are one and the same, and you, then what you have is Columbia orbiting above and the eagle carrying Apollo landing on the moon. I mean, it's like all going right directly back to this whole uh, Osiris, Horus, Isis, Nimrod, Semiramis, Tammuz, it, it, all of it's there. Uh, when we look at the space shuttle program, this is a great uh, quote from William Cooper. He talks about uh, all the names, missions, landing sites, and events in the Apollo space program echo the occult metaphors, rituals, and symbology of the Illuminati's secret religion. Another revelation to those who understand the symbolic language of the Illuminati is the hidden meaning of the names of the space shuttles. Quote, 
a Colombian enterprise to endeavor for the discovery of Atlantis, and all challengers shall be destroyed. Maybe it's just a coincidence. The new program, after they retired the space shuttle program, is called the Orion program. You ever notice how it's always going back to this Nimrod thing? Apollo, Orion, right? Um, uh, of course, the Orion program, this is new enough. You go watch videos uh, uh, about the, Apollo, um, the Orion program. You'll see, I've, I've seen several videos from NASA showing one of the holdups that they're having in development of this process is figuring out how to um, accurately and appropriately um, shield the spaceship and the astronauts from the intense radiation of space. Wait, wait a minute. You told us that a bunch of astronauts went to the moon in a tin can with jumpsuits on. Why don't you just put them in jumpsuits and throw them in a tin can and throw them back up there again? Why are they having so much difficulty shielding the spaceship so the computers don't get all jacked up and making sure the astronauts are properly protected from the intense radiation of space, like, oh, the Van Allen belt and what's beyond it? You know, and this is one of the big questions I have, Michael. They're telegraphing something to me, in my opinion. <laughs> you know, I'm like, well, if you're having this much trouble figuring out how to get through radiation, they obviously didn't do it in the 60s and 70s because here we are in 2014 and they haven't figured out how to do it. Orion will be able to travel to the moon and they're saying to Mars or an asteroid, you know, so they want to go further out. So maybe you could say, well, they're going to be exposed longer, but they were still out there for a long period of time, guys. You know, it doesn't take much ra radiation to jack you up. <laughs> um Orion also could carry crews or supplies to the space station. Orion will launch on top of a huge rocket called the Heavy Lift Launch Vehicle. It will take Orion farther into space than people have been before. Orion will use energy from the sun to get power from it while in space. Sounds cool. Sounds interesting. Uh, then there's this, the OSIRIS-REx program. Wow. <laughs> in 2016... NASA intends to launch the Osiris Rex. Okay, Rex means King Osiris, of course, is who we're talking about here. King Osiris. They're going to launch the King Osiris, <laughs> a probe designed to explore and take samples from, and I'm not making this up, folks, the Bennu asteroid. So King Osiris, Osiris Rex, supposedly stands for, now this is what they say the acronym stands for, Origins Spectral Interp Interpretation Resource Identification Security and Regolith Explorer. <laughs> do, you get, do you get the sense that they're just really trying to like force an acronym here just for the sake of honoring their god? Oh, good grief. OSIRIS-REx is scheduled to arrive at the Bennu. Now remember, the Bennu is the sole bird of OSIRIS. That is the phoenix, which represents resurrection. They're supposed to arrive at the Bennu in 2018. And the plan is to analyze the asteroid and in 2019 to take samples from it to bring back to Earth. shall be the whole of the law. I am alone. There is no God where I am. NASA's official logo. If you've ever looked at NASA's official logo, both their, their official insignia and their official seal, you'll see that the most prominent object in the, in the seal is a, a red swooshing object. They call that the chevron or the vector. If you ask NASA's public affairs office that this symbology is featured so heavily in their insignia and seal, they'll give you what really amounts to the, the standard facile cover story for the unilluminated. They'll tell you that that is uh, a representation of a hypersonic wing design from the 1950s. Um, which was the time the logo was created. Um, 
not exactly the case. Um, someone might want to ask the Russian Federal Space Agency, Roscosmos, that was formed in 1992, why they chose that same logo. And while you're at it, you can ask the Chinese, who formed their space agency in 1996, why in the world they're using a hypersonic wing design from the 1950s as their official logo. Then you can ask the Japanese, the South Koreans, Taiwanese, Malaysia, Mexico, Iran, all of these countries, even Bulgaria. They all utilize the vector symbology in their space agency logos for their, their national space agencies. Um, it gets even deeper. You can go and look at the individual manned program patches for NASA. The Mercury program, for example, uh, a blatant use of covert symbology. In every logo dealing with the Mercury program, you'll see what looks like a number seven in their logo. And again, NASA's official story is that they put this number seven there so that they could pay homage to the original seven Mercury astronauts. Um, kind of forgetting the fact that only six Mercury astronauts actually flew into space because number seven never never did. Deke Slayton had a heart problem, so he, he didn't get to go up. Uh, so there were only six Mercury astronauts, yet there's a seven in every single logo. That's in the official mission insi or official program insignia for Mercury, as well as the six individual mission patches carry this logo. And it carries on to the space shuttle program. If you look at the Apollo logo, the Apollo logo has a big letter A in it. At least that's what they want you to believe. But it's not. Again, that's just a, a simple way of explaining away the inclusion of this vector symbology in the logo. And if you go to the space shuttle program, uh, the original space shuttle STS program patch is a triangular patch that, again, hides the use of the chevronic vector symbology. And that also goes for many of the STS-specific mission patches. Uh, every single one of the International Space Station expedition patches carry the vector symbology. The Russian Mir Space Station used the vector symbology. That was their, their official logo. And you can even go deeper and look at military industrial complex companies. Look at the logo on a company like Lockheed Martin, two vectors. Um, the XPRIZE logo, Ames Research Labs, US Space Command, when you get into the military realm, the United States Space Command, their official logo is the vector symbol. And when you look at the military's individual space-specific programs, all of them, all of them deal with vector symbology and their official insignias. And the, the question really becomes, who or what are these people paying homage to? And the truth, quite frankly, is out of this world. Did you guys catch that Air Force patch? Holy shit, I looked it up and found a couple other weird ones. Anyway, after I saw that segment, I insisted on researching more. I found early on that this symbol may also be referred to as a delta. Makes enough sense. Anyway, here's a few more space agencies from different parts of the world with the same symbolism. I put a link to another great video on the subject that covers more as well. What's interesting about the UK logo is that it appeared on Doctor Who three years prior to its establishment. Speaking of sci-fi shows, did NASA and the Air Force copy off of Star Trek, or did Star Trek copy off of them? I do know that someone that designed some of the Star Trek logos was also contracted to create some of the NASA logos. That doesn't make it any less weird. In fact, I think it makes it weirder. Russia and China too? Also NASA goes out of their way to mimic Star Trek? They have a full timeline laid out on the show. The top two rows are the evolution of our space programs, and the bottom row is the evolution of the United Nations. It goes from the United Nations to the United Earth in 2150, and finally to the United Federation of Planets in 2161. You guys know the quote, life imitates art. Well, it couldn't be more true, but I would replace the word art with the word programming, and it's freaky.
staging part of their mission for nearly an hour in living color with exceptionally clear behind the scenes audio of conversations discussing the techniques used to achieve a disingenuous picture depicting the earth at a distance in order to falsely demonstrate their far journey from it and their ability to survive passing through the Van Allen radiation belts. What most people don't realize is that all the characters in this story are all actors in the same club, as George Carlin put it. Evidence that is coming from primarily NASA, the government, and the military. Three organizations that have proven to be completely untrustworthy on numerous counts. If we were to put them on trial, you know, they would all be guilty of being pathological liars. They own the Federal Reserve, they own the World Bank, they own Hollywood and the media, they own Freemasonry, and much, much more. Freemasonry is one of the oldest secret societies in the world. Freemasons are scattered across the world to serve as instruments for the elite agenda. Several of these Freemasons work for NASA. Story. Nicholas Copernicus, Johannes Kepler, Galileo Galilei, and Isaac Newton, the four forefathers of the globalist heliocentric doctrine, all posed for Masonic portraits, highlighting various symbols and hands. Sir Isaac Newton was even knighted by Queen Anne at Trinity's College Masonic Master's Lodge. An inordinate number of NASA astronauts, the current propagators of the globalist heliocentric doctrine, are or were admitted Freemasons as well. John Glenn, two-time U.S. Senator and one of NASA's first astronauts, is a known Mason. Buzz Aldrin Jr., the second man to lie about walking on the moon, is an admitted ring-wearing, hand-sign flashing, 33rd degree Mason from Mont Avril Lodge number 339 in Florida. Thomas Stafford on Apollo 10 and 18, Gemini 7 and 9, was a Mason at Western Star Lodge number 138 in Oklahoma. Paul Weitz on Skylab 2, that more astronauts and people of key importance in NASA are affiliated with the Brotherhood as well, but not so open about their membership. For there to be this many Masons, members of the world's largest and oldest secret society, involved with the promotion and propagation of this globalist heliocentric doctrine from its outset to today, should raise some serious...
I am alone. There is no God where I am. 